Greetings, class, and welcome to week three CIS 4710. Uh, this week, as we look at your syllabus, we are going to be covering security foundations. Last week, we talked about networking foundations. Um, we will also uh, kind of review homework one. Uh, really simple. Uh, there was a tutorial on that on the YouTube channel, and we will be covering Chapter 3 uh, in in depth. So uh, just a real quick note on Homework 1. Let's just uh, bring that up here real quick under Assignments. And you know what? I am going to... Just list out a homework. Most everybody did very well in this assignment, so no, no complaints there. Um, basically, what I was looking for is a screenshot of the Cali box, the Cali VM, and a screenshot of the uh, VM environment. Uh, both could have been done, uh, sufficed very well either either way. Um, so basically your shell, what I was looking for, I mean, if you gave me a, sh a screenshot, there we go, there's a good uh, screenshot of a VM shell uh, that shows all the settings and everything else, and then a screenshot that, yes, I actually got uh, Cali running in VMware Workstation. So, yeah, real simple, 20 points, uh, easy 20 points, and most everybody aced that one. Uh, it's meant to be a, a encouragement builder um, for for students who may uh, just be coming back into working with VMware um, and getting used to it, getting getting your your uh, sea legs, if you will. Uh, but this week, we're going to talk about security foundations. I have a short lecture this week. Um, and with that, uh, we're basically going to just talk about some security fundamentals from an administrative uh, and organizational perspective, as well as uh, some more technical components of the of the chapter, which are going to be around, uh, we'll get that in a second here, uh, like firewalls, network security, vulnerability scanners, um, as well as policies, procedures, guidelines, things, things like that. So that's what this chapter is about. And we start off by talking about the triad, or the security triad, and different textbooks uh, look at this in different um, different ways, but uh, as it says in your textbook, the triad is a set of attributes or uh, properties that define what security is, what what it is broken down to in its component parts. Basically, the three areas that they talk about are confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So, on that note, confidentiality is basically the concept of keeping something secret or the methodologies of keeping something uh, not exposed, I guess is probably the best way to explain it. Uh, they go through several examples in your textbook, but confidentiality is basically revolves around encryption and encryption me mechanisms and keeping um keeping secrets safe uh so to speak integrity uh is a very uh hand in hand component with confidentiality and that is to make sure that something has not changed integrity is the ability to ensure that you have um the authority for lack of a better term uh, to lock something down that it cannot be modified. So it has to deal with modification. Confidentiality is to keep it secret, keep it safe. Integrity is to ensure it's not changed. And those are the two that get confused the most out of the triad. Availability is 
pretty simple. Is it there? Is it available? Can I get to it? Um, is it up and running? And, and availability uh, deals a lot with ensuring that denial of service attacks don't happen, ransomware attacks don't happen, um, and the like. So out of the three, availability has always been the easiest to explain and convey. You will see definitions of these three on uh, your midterm and probably on your final as well. So you need to understand uh, and identify all of them. Now let's talk a little bit about expansion of the triad. So that's those three areas are really good for uh, a baseline foundational explanation of security. But it's not everything. So in expansion of the triad, uh, we look at something called the Parkerian hexad, which expands upon it, and we look at possession or control, um, which is where if you had mistakenly handed the, say, an external drive um, to a friend thinking you were handing them back their drive, but it was actually your drive, well, they're now in control of it because they have possession of it. You may have it encrypted, it may be kept confidential, right? Its integrity may be in check, but you've lost control. So possession is a big part of security as to whether you have control of an asset. Authenticity is very important, and, and this is an area that is expanded upon, especially with digital signatures and digital uh, signing of documents. It is referred to as a you know, non-repudiation step, so proving that you are who you are. And authenticity ensures the user that they have a legitimate copy of software it ensures the user that they are dealing with material that is authentic and true. And finally, we have utility. So utility deals um, with the ability to, or usefulness of an item. Um, if it has no utility, then it's useless and it's worthless basically to us. If it does have utility, it's usable. And we can set a value to that utility as well. And that is very important when we talk about our next slide, which is risk. Risk, we have to ask, well, what constitutes a risk? Risk is all about loss and if uh, and the potential for loss. Let me, let me put it that way. The potential for loss uh, basically is a calculation, and, and we have this in our 4670 class where we go through entire risk calculation models and single loss expectancy and annual rate of occurrence, et cetera, et cetera. We, we don't go into it in that in depth in, in, in this course, but it is imperative that we understand that it is out there and that we test it. So what constitutes a risk? Uh, the risk is basically if we have an asset, and that asset could be hardware, it could be software, it could be information, it could be data, what's the likelihood of its loss? What's the probability of its loss, right? What's the occurrence or the percentage that that probability will happen? And ultimately, if lost, whatever that is, that, that data, that asset, et cetera, what's the cost to the organization? What is the cost to the company? And then we can talk about mitigating risks or ensuring against risks and everything. That's a topic that we deal in, in 4670 at length. So we're just going to kind of skip over that. But it's imperative that we understand that there is risk. And basically what penetration testing is all about is the testing of that risk, right? And trying to identify vulnerabilities, the pathway to that risk. And once we've done that, how do we mitigate it? If we've identified a new um, vulnerability that's associated with risk of loss, how do we fix it? 
So that's the fundamental premise, honestly, of this entire course. We get into policies and standards and procedures. Uh, the policies are those that basically outline or dictate what is to be done, right? And a security policy is basically a statement of intent with regards to the resources of an organization and how it's going to deal with threats. Uh, in essence, uh, policies are, you know, essential to uh, a good corporate governance. And since the policies are uh, basically lines in the sand, basically, for um, drawing boundaries as to what is good practice and what is poor practice. These come from standards. Standards are set basically by global policy or national policy or best practices and they may also be sub policies uh, and they have some sort of flow to them uh, and they look at basically how standards can be applied to multiple industries so uh, a lot of good standards uh, especially security standards um, uh, there are sets of standards that provide guidance for an organization, like NIST standards or ISO standards or PCI standards. Procedures are your step-by-steps. These are individually written on a company-by-company, uh, organization-by-organization basis. And you take that information from the policies and the standards, and you put these steps in. And they are modified consistently, uh, constantly. Uh, because as you find better practices, as policies are changed, you might find better ways to build the mousetrap, right? You always find a better way to build the mousetrap. Um, you can see that in a high-level uh, guidance uh, like that of a policy, you likely won't have to change it that much. But in a procedure, you can. Sometimes when you change procedures, it will roll up and change the policy stance or the standards stance. Now, you may not run into guidelines as you were looking for security you know, programs or, or processes to put into place. But guidelines are basic – are basically, they're not standards in that they may not be required. But instead, they are suggestions on how to uh, modify policies or put stuff into um, practice. That's why guidelines and best practices are synonymous with one another. With security technologies, basically this is where we get into the meat and potatoes from a defensive standpoint. Now, you're probably asking yourself, well, why are we going into all this if this is a penetration testing class, right? If it's an ethical hacking class. Well, number one, right, you know, a little bit of Sun Tzu here, know your enemy. And if you don't know your enemy, you won't know how to defeat them. So you have to understand the different types of firewalls, packet filters, etc., in order to circumvent them. So uh, firewalls are basically those traditional security devices that block. And there are different types of firewalls. There are packet filters, which just basically look at packets, and they look at information in packets. Source and destination IP address, source and destination port, um, flags, things of that nature, and then they pass or deny those packets based on information in the header. You have stateful filtering, which looks at the state of a connection. So you see stateful filtering primarily on outbound connections to a firewall, like when you have workstations that are going out to the internet and they are attempting to connect to a web server. Well, we don't have outbound packet filters, typically. Uh, we can if we want to, but we don't have to. But even if we did, once a connection is made, a state is established, typically if we're using port address translation, and that state is then controlled, timed, 
and monitored by the firewall. All right, we do that to make sure that that connection does not become hijacked. Deep packet inspection is used uh, as a next generation or uh, advanced generation firewall uh, tactic where we look past those headers. We don't just look at the information inside of IP, a TCP, a UDP, an ICMP header. We go into the data of the packet and we look at um, patterns within the, hacket, within the packet. We look at uh, potentially threatening data within the packet based on information that we've garnered from previous attacks, from previous signatures. And then we can make decisions based on that. And deep packet inspection not only works with firewalls, it also works with uh, advanced intrusion prevention systems as well, which we'll get to that a little bit later. The application layer firewall um, has to leverage deep packet inspection. And um, it will work basically as a WAF, a web application firewall, and allow or disavow uh, connections based on a lot of different information. It could be DNS information, it could be domain, it could be um, uh, data pattern information, uh, it, it could be a lot of different things that you can define. And this all comes into unified threat management. Unified threat management is a concept of an overarching architectural security design that um, leverages multiple assets into a security um, concept or a security domain. Typically at the center of that is going to be your firewall and intrusion prevention system, but they may port a lot of the data from these different assets, these different appliances, your WAFs, your load balancers, your firewalls, your endpoints, uh, your endpoint uh, protection to a centralized management um, console. And that console takes all that information, uh, analyzes all the data, and then can make suggestions or even take action uh, based on the threats or potential threats that are being presented in the environment. Uh, going on further, uh, it's also uh, good to understand intrusion detection systems, intrusion detection systems versus intrusion prevention systems. Intrusion detection systems are older. They are based on um, signatures. Uh, they can come in two flavors, network-based or host-based. Network-based means you have a sensor that's out there that is pulling in packets from a mirror port or an Armon port and a remote monitoring port. And they then basically look at header information. They only look at header information and then can make a determination as to a potential attack based on a signature. Signatures are come in two flavors, atomic or composite. Atomic signatures, basically you're looking at one single packet, right? or composite signatures where you're looking at a string of, of packets within a TCP stream. An intrusion prevention system, or sometimes referred to as IDS plus, does everything that an intrusion detection system does, right? But it improves upon it. It can look at behavior or heuristic um, information. It does this typically through deep packet inspection, like what we talked about in the firewall. Um, the typo here, I apologize. Uh, security information and event management. I uh, should have put a period at the, at, the, at the end of that, or SEAM for short. This is a, a data collector. So um, it seems like Alien Vault, a modified version of Splunk um, and uh, Q Radar. There's a lot of ones out on the market. They are log-based. They're and basically an analytics engine. They take all the data from all these different sources. They can take it from firewalls and IPSs and hosts. Uh, typically from hosts, they're going to take it from event logs 
or Linux logs and um, uh, mesh that together. And then they come up with an analysis. It's very processor intensive. Uh, it is the basis a lot of times for um, AI uh, in security and or what they refer to as big data in security. This is where you get into those concepts uh, within this field because you just are getting just an, a massive amount of information and data from all these sources. And the larger your organization, the harder it is to see because there's just a lot of noise. If you can imagine uh, these systems having to collect all this information and as you turn the sensitivity up on them uh, it's harder to manage but if you keep the sensitive sensitivity too low an attacker may be able to circumvent the security systems so it's a fine line here uh, within the defensive parameter as to uh, detection versus performance and how well you want to be able to detect a threat. And this goes directly to a lot of tactics that offensive security professionals have to employ by thoroughly reconning an environment before pulling off or attempting an attack. And hackers, same kind of concept. So, from the defensive side, it's all about being prepared. Uh, defense in depth, you, the layers of your defense. So have a firewall, have an intrusion prevention system, have a, a seam, have log monitoring, have uh, all these different layers. And then defense in breadth, how wide that you go with your defensives and basically how sensitive you make them. Uh, that is going to depend a lot on compute. Uh, it's going to depend a lot on performance, how much performance hit you can take. And also, uh, it depends on how uh, well uh, or how many personnel in your security department can actually put eyes on these systems. Now remember, these systems can be very intelligent, but at the end of the day, it's a human that has to interpret, uh, is, it an, is it an attack? Is it not an attack? Did an attack occur? Did it not occur? And that's when we get into the log analysis and auditing portions of security, because this comes after the fact. So after an attack happens, whether a breach occurred or not, and remember, attack is an attempt. A breach is an actual, oh, something got stolen, something got um, owned. And then the auditing can be done in two different ways. You have forensic auditing was after the fact when something bad's happened. Or you just have normal auditing where you're just checking to make sure all of these systems, all of these controls are in place. All right? And then log analysis does both. It, it looks for the attacks uh, either... Uh, confirms or denies them, uh, or it's a forensic tool with um, digital forensics as a, um, a supporting piece of data analysis. So in summary for this week, uh, know the concepts uh, as we talked about them. Know the triad, confidentiality, availability, and integrity. Know all of those very well. Uh, know the difference between defense in depth, how many layers you have, and defense in breadth, how wide you go, how sensitive you make uh, all of these controls. And know the different technologies, your firewalls, your intrusion prevention systems, your intrusion detection systems, your logging, your SIEM, etc. So that's going to wrap it up here for Chapter 3. Uh, going back to the syllabus here real quick. So it looks like homework two is due next week, as is lab one. Uh, I have a walkthrough for lab one already uh, online. I'll make sure that that is uh, good to go. And I will be going through that uh, here as well. Uh, homework two, we can take a look at that real quick. Homework two is pretty simple 
from a perspective. We'll have a have another lecture on Lab One here. Uh, actually, uh, it's already it's already up. But uh, homework two, basically, you do a ZenMap InMap scan, and you make sure that your OpenVos NVT database is up and running. Uh, that will automatically happen when you install OpenVos. So you have to go through the steps of installing OpenVos. So I think I believe I believe I have an example of that as well uh, on the YouTube channel. So you can look there uh, for for help if if need be. But basically, I'm just looking for the screenshot of your ZenMap InMap scan of uh, your target, which is the Windows box and the um, OpenVos scan uh, as well. Actually, let's before I misspeak here, I want you to I I want you to 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 scan your system. Okay, so your host, your host system, not not the Windows box not the VM that we have in lab one, but your host system. Now, uh, piece of advice, very important, so listen up. Look at dropping your firewall and doing the scans. You'll get more data. Now, you can do the scan with your firewall up, and at some point in time you should, to be honest with you. And whether you give me the scan with your firewall up or down, I will accept either one. From a learning standpoint, if you drop your firewall, you're going to see more data because it's going to open up all the ports and uh, you'll get a better understanding of your of your system. Uh, also, if you've patched your system and it's totally 100% up to date, you probably won't get very much. If you're one of those folks that hasn't patched your system, well, do this. And again, I'm only looking for the two screenshots, but this is just helpful advice for your own personal computing. Uh, if you haven't updated your system in a while, if you haven't ran ran Windows Update or whatever the Apple equivalent is for a Mac, uh, scan it first before you do an update and see what the results are. Okay, it's just kind of interesting. It's one of those geeky things that us security nerds, you know, look at from time to time, and it gives you a better understanding if you ever see that in the wild uh, again. But anyway, for bottom line, I'm only looking for an InMap or a ZenMap screenshot and your OpenVos scan uh, screenshot. Also, uh, download your PDF of your OpenVos and upload that in Blackboard as well. So that's going to do it here for uh, this week, week three in 4710. I uh, will see you guys around and have a great week.